Now we have uh, in between us uh, Bharat Jaiswani. I believe Bharat Jaiswani, sir. Uh, can you please switch on your video? Uh, hi. Uh, Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hi. Uh, so, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Bharat. How are you? All good, sir. Thank you for having me here. Good to see a colleague, uh, CA. Yes. Yeah. So uh, let me take the privilege of uh, uh, introducing uh, Bharat Jaiswani. <clears throat> Uh, qualification wise is the chatted content in meanwhile meanwhile just keep a uh, uh, eye on the chat i'll be sharing the profile of bharat and also hmm. an interesting link which you can just uh, go through uh, may you can access that and i'll tell what exactly the story behind that while i introduce bharat so just keep in case any issue bharat yeah oh, yeah i'll just yeah i think uh, got it yeah it is there so, sir, first of all, thank you so much for uh, having me here. Uh, and uh, uh, you have uh, very much inspired me and motivated me. So, uh, with your kind words, uh, so because we had the conversation uh, and I asked you about the book uh, even before uh, when we had our first uh, call. So, uh, with your kind, it, it, it really, you know, motivates me to uh, work on uh, developing my skills and you know uh, reaching out to more people and coming up with more content which is which could be very useful for uh, our professionals uh, so uh, thank you so much thank you so much again sir and uh, so today my uh, topic is uh, journey of a financial fraud so the basic uh, purpose behind this, the whole purpose, uh, what I am trying to bring here to the some the learning objective from this session, is uh, we are trying to analyze, you know, how uh, the fraud happens from the beginning, from the conceptualization, the, as the idea comes in, how it progresses, how they move forward, and mm -hmm. finally where it ends, uh, maybe to a conviction or not so that is that is the idea but uh of course mo all all we are all cfe members all of us know how the process takes place what i'm trying to do here is to trying to bring in uh, a human intervention a professional intervention where wherever possible by bringing in the insights as to uh how uh things happen prevent them or uh bring in the justice at the right moment so based based on the insights i'm trying to bring in how we could uh, interfere with this process of fraud and to stop it uh, wherever we can so uh, a few insights just you know uh, before i start about the journey I just uh, just a second the journey yeah. of the fraud see we read we read the uh, report to the we are uh, invited I go to the nations by association <laughs> for examiners. The CFE is the institute which is doing a great job of, uh, uh, you know, spreading the information of uh, creating the awareness related to fraud. But uh, I have seen in my professional experience, whoever I have, whichever client I have met with, that it is it is really uh, something that. Uh, uh, most uh, whenever I, I meet a client and I tell them about, you know, uh, the risk of fraud. So th th there was this one client who was, I was, who was consulting me for some other uh, transactions for something he was consulting me. And I was, I happened to go through his books of accounts and uh, the whole accounting financial system. And just by having a look, I told him that, you know, you uh, are at a, operating at a very high risk. Uh, there is a risk of fraud internally as well as externally. You do not have any uh, system. There was There is no whistleblower system. There is no fraud policy. There is no internal control system, a system systematic internal control system in place that could, you know, uh, prevent. And uh, that is, that is I feel, uh, an organization that doing having a turnover of about 200, 500 crores, and not having even a formal internal control system, no uh, ethics training, no kind of uh, process to protect the whistleblowers. Uh, it is, it is. I think it is a suicidal uh, organization that that is bound to lose a lot of money, and uh, and that is what exactly happened with 
that organization. So this, when I told him about the fraud risk management system, which they are supposed to have, which they uh, declined uh, and they actually laughed it out that, you know, fraud does not happen at our place. Whoever I have interacted with uh, on these lines. And it was just six months later, I, I was called in for investigating a fraud and uh, they they were about to lose about 80 crores. And, uh, uh, and I think they did because even after uh, our investigation, it, the recovery was uh, very difficult because uh, obviously they do not have any system to, uh, so because they do not have a system, there is al almost a uh, lack of any kind of evidence. Uh, so that was the case with them. And uh, again, so this, this uh, we need to, we, the CFE is doing a great job and uh, we as professionals also need to uh, carry the torch. We need to spread the awareness as more, as much as it is possible. Uh, and uh, I think we should have more initiatives in, on those lines, which we are, but we should do more initiatives on those lines. So this is one thing. Now, an employee, a simple employee who works for an organization, uh, who has been in an organization for, uh, let's just say, even for five years, 10 years, they are more than capable of uh, committing a fraud. Because see, when, when they are, when they, they are, operating on a regular basis even if uh, they are they do not have a criminal mind which which rarely which they rarely do so they are they are just normal people who are doing a job and when they are going through a process a simple for example a purchase manager is going through a simple procurement process on a regular basis so he he understands that the, you know the, the, this is the loophole that there, there there is no competitive bidding in place there is no uh, oversight by management uh, it is not. There's not. It is not required. The minimum number of uh, vendors that I need to get to, uh, you know, finalize, place an order. So there, there is no such thing which, uh, which is there. And on those, on those lines, it is. They, they are very much aware that you know, it is, it is very easy for me to, if, if I can, you know, just select a vendor, which is, which whom I can collude with. Uh, who could uh, uh, give me a uh, good share of the money uh, that we can get so they can he can always book an order for about uh, whatever uh, 10 lakhs and uh, you know uh, distribute the overpriced 5 lakhs uh, amongst with the colluding uh, partner so it, it it becomes very easy for a person to commit fraud once you are in the system and you don't need a criminal mind for that so again uh, as even the statistics uh, of the cfa report to the nation they tell us that more than 50 percent uh, of the offenders are the first time offenders also and they do not have any criminal background and they they would not have been caught in a due diligence process because of, of course they were not criminals in the first place but going through the system they did realize how they could commit the fraud how they could uh, take advantage of it and that that goes uh, once you are once you are aware of the system it it becomes very easy so uh, touching again on the fraud triangle which is again the i think every book about fraud uh, except mine talks about the fraud triangle and it is it is uh, i have I've, I've always believed that it is very important uh, theoretically but when you are doing an actual investigation, uh, it is very hard to, you know, uh, correlate. Uh, I mean, you could you 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 would find that, uh, you know, the fraud triangle does exist. There there were there was motivation, there was an opportunity, and there was uh, the rationalization that that was there. All of that was there, of course. But uh, to actually use it in a practical scenario, that knowing that there could be motivation, opportunity, and rationalization, and then to curb it. That is something which is, I think, uh, practically it has been very difficult. And in my opinion, the fraud triangle, uh, the opportunity uh, aspect is, is definitely the most important aspect, though all of them have been given equal weightage in the fraud triangle. But I think opportunity aspect has to be understood, has to be uh, touched upon because opportunity aspect is the only which can be controlled physically. 
wherein you can have the right internal control systems. You can uh, have a good fraud detection enterprise wide fraud risk management system, which could prevent fraud and detect fraud immediately so that uh, it, it deters the person from committing fraud in the first place. And so because the other two uh, aspects, the other two legs of the triangle, which is rationalization and uh, motivation slash pressure, both of them are in the mind. So when one, when once a person finds an opportunity, it is very easy for them to be motivated. It is very easy for them to rationalize. But if you do not have the opportunity, if you realize that there is no way to commit this fraud and you would be caught if you do so, so then all those motivations and uh, all the rationalizations, uh, they, they go in a drain. So that is the, in, in my opinion, that is the most important leg and organizations need to have an internal control system. So let's just start with the journey of the financial fraud. So this is this is how it will proceed. We we'll start with uh, the conceptualization. The fraudster would first uh, conceptualize how uh, they are supposed to commit the fraud. Uh, that is the first step. The idea, as I said, would normally come in when in during their employment or in in the process when they are working with uh, an organization. So uh, or interacting with an organization because the fraud can also be committed by external parties, not just the internal parties. But when you realize that there is an opportunity, that is where it begins. Uh, so that is once. Second step is obviously once you have conceptualized how you are supposed to commit the fraud, you have also planned the process of uh, concealment because at that, at that moment itself, when you conceptualize how you are going to commit the fraud, you will also be planning how to conceal it because that is the whole full circle so that uh, it is concealment is again the most important part of fraud because if it is not concealed it will uh, it will not be effective it will get you get caught it will not be effective rationalization uh, after the concept the commit commitment comes commitment of fraud comes then obviously the concealment after the fraud has been committed you have to find out ways uh, how to conceal it the rationalization then comes again after first when you are conceptualizing the fraud that time you would be rationalizing okay why i am doing it what is the purpose what uh, and even after then committing the fraud again you need to rationalize as to why uh, did you do it and uh, because it is a human nature you don't want to feel like a criminal you want to justify your actions you want to in your in your mind itself you want to know that what you did was justified and uh, that is why you did it. Then after uh, the rationalization, the fraud could continue for years. Uh, even the CFA report to the nation tells us that an average uh, for about 12 months is the average what a fraud goes undetected. And it can also be 36 months or more. So uh, if, if the fraud does get detected, then uh, hopefully there will be a whistleblower who would be blowing the whistle? It could be uh, somebody inside the organization. It could be someone outside the organization. But again, for all that to happen, we need a proper whistleblower system. We need a proper fraud policy, a whistleblower protection, the hotline, or uh, rather the means of communication, which could be used by the whistleblower. All that system has to be in place, which again, in my professional experience, I've seen very, very few organizations who have taken uh, uh fraud seriously it, it is something which is uh just not uh, taken seriously when i meet them i tell them that you know organizations are uh, losing five percent of their revenue due to fraud which is again research-based data uh, which is uh, again provided by the association of certified fraud examiners every year so it is a research-based data which based on which uh, now most of the organizations which I know that they are operating at uh, even profits lower than 10%. Uh, most of most of them would be operating at 15% or 10%. So now based on those numbers, if you look at it, it is you are losing at about, you know, 25% or 33% of your profit, uh, which 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 is the money of your sales, not even profit, the uh, yeah, 25% of the profit in, in that case, 25 to 33% uh, of your profit. Now that that is the money lost, which is totally uh, in an invaluable uh, activity, which does not provide any 
uh, useful uh, attribute to the organization, just lost money, which could be uh, prevented even with the most basic internal control systems, which we, we can deter the fraud. Just just the awareness in the organization that you know there uh, you, you people are being watched and uh, there is a monitoring system that is in place that could prevent the fraud from happening. So hopefully uh, after rationalization, I think there will be the a whistle blower. The, after the whistle is blown, then there would be the investigation, collecting the relevant evidence, reporting, and finally uh, it could lead to legal proceedings or uh, that could be the end of the case. So this is this is the whole process from the conceptualization to the end where a fraud scheme goes through. So we'll be discussing all of these aspects in a little greater detail. And uh, again, as I said, I would be trying to give some insights wherein we could interfere and uh, prevent these procedures from happening. This is just a, the same journey which we have tried to uh, show in an infographic okay so when conceptualization that is the again we come to the first stage of uh, financial fraud so opportunity as i said uh, the of the three uh, legs of the fraud triangle opportunity is the most important definitely because uh, other two the other two uh, are in your head uh, you can have motivation you can have greed and uh, so people people always you know argue that uh, somebody who has uh, very high pressure for example uh, somebody who has sudden family somebody in the family has had a major illness and uh, they need to uh, you know get money somehow it is it is it is for the survival uh, of their kin and that that is the reason when they come up with uh, ideas then they, they can come up with ideas how to commit uh, fraud how to commit misappropriation of assets so that 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 idea comes up when uh, when they are uh, under a lot of pressure but of course uh, that is that is understandable but what you can see is when even if, if if even if a person is in under a lot of pressure and he realizes he she realizes that you know uh, i am going to get caught so when when you have those strong internal control systems when you have that management oversight and when when it is there is a complete awareness as to uh, you know you you will be getting caught so in in those scenarios it is really uh, difficult to uh, actually take that step even as much may be the pressure so opportunity is the one important leg which we should focus on and we can focus on uh, in my opinion so uh, on the backdrop we'll also discuss a case uh, fraud case so there was this company which was into manufacturing uh, manufacturing again i'll uh, change all the facts only uh, keep it relevant to the audience uh, as in whatever is re relevant from the fraud perspective that I will keep, rest I will change. So uh, the organization was uh, in the manufacturing of pickle and they were uh, doing a turnover of about, uh, say, 500 crores. Uh, so they, they had their own uh, manufacturing plants and then they had uh, different stores, exclusive stores also, wherein they, which were owned by them only. Uh, uh, but under a different company name, uh, under different, uh, but the ownership was same. So what they would do is they would manufacture the pickle, they would uh, send send it to the stores, and the stores would sell. So uh, and obviously the profit was belonged to the company itself because it was their exclusive store. So uh, then the profits would be uh, given to the company. Now uh, there was one of these managers uh, who was with the company for almost 30 years okay and uh, the company had no internal control system in place so it he was very so he was working with the company for almost 30 years so he he got he got very well aware of how 
things are moving in the organization you know how the whole process from when the manufacturing is complete how how do they dispatch it uh, what is what whatever books are maintained uh, when the dispatch happens whatever approvals are required when we get those what is the process related to you know scrapping uh, if there is if there is some form of a scrap that is generated what what is the policy related to cash because see organizations now are uh, very uh, particular about that you know you do not pay in cash you should have uh, uh, they support online payments digital payments so uh, he he did realize that you know he understood all the systems from the beginning till the actual sale sale is happened and the money is dispersed back to the company so in in that process he realized that you know there were n number of loopholes that existed and we will we will be touching upon all of them so uh, but talking to the talking about the conceptualization part that is very realized that you know there are these system weaknesses that exist okay and uh, once you once you realize that that okay there is, the company is accepting cash there is no oversight they are not doing any kind of reconciliations so and uh, i am i am the one who is managing this part also i am the one who is managing that part so there is no uh, distribution of duties so there is and my work is not being verified that that time he realized that okay the what if if i do this if i do that it would it is near impossible for someone to detect so this is this is how the idea comes in okay and then uh, of course uh, what is rationalization was that we found later what is uh, how how did he motivate the motivation was greed in his in this case there was it, there was nothing else his rationalization was that okay i have been working with the company for 30 years this is the salary that i get and i am the one who manages so many things i am among the strategic team with the company and this is what i get and the company is making hundreds of crores 200 of crores so what do i get out of that so then then that is the that that, that is where they rationalize that okay this is what i deserve it's not that it's not something the, just the salary which i have been paid is something i i deserve the uh, the more funds that come in so the conceptualization came in his case that came in only first when he saw the weaknesses in the internal control systems that were there and then based on those he uh, came up with the idea okay so as i said most organizations do not have a formal internal control system not even a system that requires a rotation of duties or a maker checker format format wherein one you know one person checks the uh, uh, work of another person not even uh, i would say uh, a very formal recon reconciliation system wherein you know uh, regularly the accounts are reconciled uh, with the banks and the accounts are reconciled with the vendors uh, and all the even even that system was not in place and it is not in place in most of the organizations so once you once you uh, once the employee realizes that first of all there there is a loophole in the system okay and the chances of getting caught are near impossible it is you are not going to get caught so it is very easy to start the process so uh, there could be there could be as i said there could be pressure also but unless and until there is a good clear opportunity there is it is near uh, so one would not take the step so once uh, the understanding is there they could move forward sometimes another a case which i have also observed wherein what happens is that they do not conceptualize the fraud what happens is that they uh, land at it somehow somehow they bump into it wherein uh, a small case had happened wherein a employee was supposed to deposit uh, the tds so you deduct the tds from the employees and the tds is to be deposited with the uh, government with the tax authorities but and i'm talking this 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 case i'm talking about 15 years back 10 15 years back when i think probably when i had started so so th th that time they were also had an option to deposit the money in the form of cash directly to the government 
Uh, I don't know if they still have it. I think we have to deposit it online only. So at that time, they used to deposit money through cash. So the one of the accountants was responsible for taking the money and uh, uh, collecting uh, uh, the money that was in cash, going to the bank and depositing in the government's account. And uh, he was the one who was responsible. So he just, he was busy with some other things and he could not uh, do his job. He could not actually deposit the money. And when his manager asked him, you know, did you deposit the tax, the withheld tax? He said, yeah, yeah, because he did not want to, he, he had decided that, you know, he will do it uh, the next day. So he, the, the manager just asked the accountant that, okay, the tax has been deposited. So you have all the details uh, of what tax was uh, deducted. You just, you know, pass the entry that the tax has been deposited. And uh, that was it. Nobody asked anything. There was no uh, question about it. And the man realized that, you know, he had the money and he just took it and uh, he absconded. Uh, and then the notice came from the tax authorities. And at that time, it it, it did not, it, they were not so prompt also. The, uh, the notice came after a few months. And uh, so this is how he realized when, when he was uh, actually did not intend to commit a fraud, but doing so, he realized that, you know, there could be a way out of this uh, and it, it would not go detected. So uh, that is also sometimes that happens wherein the people can uh, realize something and uh, proceed with that. I think I'll look at the chat also. Yeah, Bharat, probably we can keep all the questions uh, at the end. Okay, uh, okay. Right, sir, right, sir. Right, sir. Right, sir. Right, Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Time. And I see we are uh, anyways running late. So I will just uh, move forward. Yeah. It's right, sir. Right, sir. Few, few minutes this side, no problem, yeah. Right, problem right, right, sir. Right, sir. So uh, when you conceptualize, I mean, when the fraudster would conceptualize, you know, that, you know, this, this is the fraud scheme uh, that I would like to, th that would be easy for me to commit. At that time, he would uh, probably uh, not want to collude with anybody because as long as it is possible, the, the fraudster would not like to collude with anybody because when if you collude, then, then they will have to share the proceeds. The more the number of people, the proceeds uh, need to be shared. So that's why they would prefer not to collude with anybody. However, uh, the, sometimes it is not possible to... Uh, complete a scheme without uh, colluding with anybody. But with, with the collusion, uh, it, it brings in its own unique you know, risks and attributes. Uh, the collusion with as more the number of people join in, in the collusion. So you need to have a bigger reward for it. So the, the fraud scheme that was originally planned, now it has to, it has to be do, done on a larger scale. It, or maybe other schemes need to be planned so that everybody gets uh, at least enough to be taking the risk of committing the fraud. And uh, <laughs> with uh, collusion also comes in uh, a chance of, because, because now the reward is expected to be a bit higher. So uh, with the collusion, you want to, uh, uh, you take, you increase the scale and because of that, it increases the risk also. See, because some fraud schemes, as long as you are doing very small transactions, we are below the threshold of any materiality, uh, which is being set by the organization. It is very easy to continue doing that. But when, if more people join in, more stomachs are to be fed. And for that reason, you, you would probably need a bigger uh, scheme. Also, there is a possibility that uh, one of the person could rat you out if there is some kind of... a uh, issue uh, amongst you so that, that that could that could be a problem so again as i said it brings unique risks and uh, attributes uh, also with collusion the chances of getting caught can be lower also because now all of all the people who are involved some one who is uh, making the checks the other who is verifying the other who is depositing the one who is making managing the procurement the operations all of them are colluding together so there is nobody who is actually verifying your, uh, uh, you know, data. So it is there is there's a possibility that that could reduce the risk. So again, it depends on situation to situation.
so committing committing the fraud finally once once you have conceptualized once the fraudster has conceptualized the scheme then they would uh, actually start with the process of actually committing the fraud i feel they would always uh, an intelligent fraudster would always start small so they would they would want to test the waters uh, they would want to check if you know uh, if they have missed something so they they are aware that you know the, these are the flaws in the system and uh, uh, th th this is the way they are planning to conceal uh, the scheme but still they would want to check so they would want to verify and uh, you one could one could always get away committing a small fraud with saying that it was a mistake or it was it, it it was immaterial so that is that is why how how it would they would normally start they would always start with committing a small fraud and that is what again in my case uh, the case which i was discussing that is what they did so what what they would what they did now i would uh, share the mo what they did so now as i said this is a pickle company the pickle company was selling uh, the goods to uh, sending the goods to the exclusive stores and those stores were supposed to sell it now they realized one thing that the company does not have uh, any con any control system whatsoever so there was uh, acceptance for cash so there was no problem with the company taking in cash i mean the stores taking in cash and depositing in the accounts of the company or giving the cash directly to the company management uh, there was no there was no objection to it there was no reconciliation for example if i am sending uh, 500 units and then you are telling me that you know uh, i've sold about 200 units so then you are supposed to have 300 units so uh, the reconciliation the stock verification that used to take place only at the end of the year at the time of audit so there was no reconciliation all throughout the year and uh, there was no verification in place during the even at the time of audit uh, the management would send in uh, a certified copy of so certified by themselves self attested copy of the stock statement which they would say they okay we have this much stock which they would which there was no auditor who was actually going to verify it who was there was no internal audit system in place there was no uh, even the statutory auditor would not take up the stock on the 31st of march to <coughs> confirm there was no such system in place and the uh, fraudsters were obviously aware of this that, that is the reason why they uh, they moved with it so uh, there was no formal system in place plus they there was no system for even for the scrap policy so for example if i am receiving any kind of you know goods so every every time i would what i would do is that if i received 500 units i would just tell them you know there the 50 units were damaged Uh, or uh, something like that so they they would they would just accept it they would not call for uh, any kind of you know uh, recall those 50 units as to why are they damaged or no or can can they be uh, processed still they, they 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 are making pickle it is damaged is damaged nothing can be done about it so they would just accept it that okay maybe it was the bottle was broken something was wrong with it and so he realized that there were there were so many loopholes so what what he did was he uh, took uh, asked the managers uh, to uh, obviously colluded with the manager he asked them to collect the money in cash from the uh, buyers of the goods so uh, the most of the money was collected in cash he would deposit about less than half of the money that he was collecting and rest he would pocket himself and for years together nobody noticed how uh, where, if if you we are making profits and that was another very big weakness in their kind they were not even verifying how much profit uh, this organization is making for example if i am uh, sending you a, a bottle of pickle which is cost which costs me 100 rupees to get it delivered to your store and the price margin that i have written on it the uh, minimum sale price the mrp it, it it is it is 150 so obviously on 100 rupees i will be earning 50 rupees of profit and then when the books are closed you show that uh, we sold the uh, pickle bottle for 120 rupees and we just earned the profit of rupees 20 in this whole process so when you look at it that way so you uh, 
you you can see it very obviously that uh, you know why why was it sold for 150 rupees or 120 rupees when it was supposed to be sold for 150 why it was sold for 120 but uh, that all this we realized after our investigation started before that it was uh, the whole uh, idea was that uh, the management could decide at what price what was the sense of having a minimum sale price or minimum retail price when you can actually sell at a lower price so uh, uh, this is how they pocket they pocketed the 30 rupees difference every on every product sometimes 30 rupees sometimes 40 rupees sometimes uh, they even sold when we investigated we found that they even sold at a loss uh, but uh, the management was not even concerned because it was the, the management has about 150 stores and uh, they did not even bother to look at one store in specific which was uh, just making a profit of about uh, 5% when others all the other stores were making a profit about 25% after cutting um, the net profit after cutting in all the costs, uh, the fixed costs and the salaries and all these things. So this was the main scheme which they brought in. Uh, so once they realize that we uh, we can we are taking cash, and the year passed, and by the end of the year they showed a profit about five percent, and other stores showed some showed so twenty percent, some fifteen, some twenty five, even thirty percent, but the organization did not uh, look into it. They did not inquire into it. They did not have a special audit or an investigation done as to why this specific organization, this specific store is making uh, such a lower profit when compared to other uh, organizations. Because of that, it they realized that, okay, this this they did once. Uh, first, first, they would show a profit about 10, 12% when others are showing 20, 25. Then they realized nothing happened. Then they go for 8%. Then they go for 5%. And this is how it continued, unless uh, because they realized that okay, nobody is watching, so we can you know uh, continue with this. Uh, it is it is just very only very few smart criminals they realize it that because see once once you have committed a scheme successfully, then you want to uh, obviously scale up. You would want to slowly uh, increase your uh, payoff from that. So you would you would obviously repeat the scheme, but you would increase the volume or you would increase the value or the margins with the same scheme. So, but that is that that again introduces a new form of risk. As as you would keep doing the same thing and you increase the volume, there is the, the since the volume would increase, there are chances of getting caught. So in this scheme itself, if they now would have gone to losses. They were they were still were working at a profit about five percent. If they would have gone to losses, then I'm sure definitely the management would have seen that why are there losses suddenly in this store? Uh, as long as there were profits, even though nominal profits, they did not look into it. So there is th this one risk that comes in. Again, now with that, uh, once once you see that one scheme is working, and then then you can figure out. Other schemes which could be uh, explored on the same grounds. For example, not on the same grounds. Rather, when you realize that okay, one system is working, and you realize that there is a there are too many flaws in the overall internal control system of this organization, then you try to explore other schemes. For example, they started uh, uh, you know uh, booking in fake expenses. For employees, uh, so we would we would analyze their uh, salary expenses. So there there is without any reason for a few months the the salary total salary expenses about five lakhs for the for some months it is fifteen lakhs without any reason why these employees were hired. There is no such season for the pickle wherein those employees were hired. So uh, th this is the way they start exploring other types of. Uh, fraud schemes when when they realize that with the system is completely flawed and when i'm doing this nobody's watching so they come up with more ideas okay i think i've covered all those points so after when so this is this is the way they uh, were committing the fraud uh, 
taking in uh, cash that was one big scheme they were then manipulating uh, the so obviously when you when you commit a fraud then you need to uh, figure out some form of concealment okay uh, some fraudsters would not go for any form of concealment also uh, because they realize that nobody is really watching it is it is uh, just uh, just wastage of their time and energy to actually take effort to conceal the fraud also because nobody has been caring about uh, the fraud that has been happening already so but that is that those are rare instances at least some oversight is there uh, so in that case an organization would come up with some form of concealment strategy that could be you know uh, manipulating the statements or the financials or uh, intercepting the uh, the statements which were sent to vendors or to the management all those kinds of things could be done uh, okay so after concealment again i said the rationalization would be uh, coming in uh, at the beginning also when you are conceptualizing uh, and it would come in late also after you have started committing the fraud uh, and you are enjoying the proceeds that time also rationalization will come because it is it is a very natural human nature you don't want to look at yourself as a criminal you don't want to feel that you are the bad guy i uh, am connected to many uh, individuals who are uh, helping uh, people with structuring transactions to evade taxes and i do ask them you know how do you uh, you are just you know evading taxes and how do you sleep i mean how do you justify your actions as to you because you are taking money from the government kitty and it is for the development of the nation which money you are taking in and how do you justify that so they have a very simple answer and uh, they they feel that they are the robin hoods uh, here who are actually taking money from the government and putting it in their own pockets and the pockets of their clients so they feel the the answer the very common answer that i get is that they are stealing from the thieves their their understanding is that the governments are corrupt the officers are corrupt the money which is being paid to the tax authorities is not being used for the development of the country it is rather being mostly used to fill the pockets of the politicians or the officers and that is the reason why they uh, justify why do they help their clients with tax evasion who of course what they feel is they are helping them save the hard earned money which their clients have earned so every everybody would want to have uh, some form of a justification some form of a, a process to uh, you know uh, protect themselves in their mind itself so that you know they so in in this case the justification as i told you the rationalization was that you know i have been working for 30 years with this organization and i deserve i am the one who made this organization what it is with my uh, strategies and my uh, inputs so i deserve much more than this 2 lakh rupees salaries that they are giving me every month i i deserve at least 10 lakhs 20 lakhs out of it uh, because that is what uh, the owners of the company are making so that is what i also deserve so that was his rationalization uh, rationalization can be managed very much uh, in organizations if you have a uh, ethics training and a right tone at the top see if if uh, the management uh, appears to be loose if if they have this kind of uh, under if you if you have that if employees feel that you know the management is just uh, not very moralistic they do not have those morals they are engaged in tax evasion laundering money and uh, even the activities uh, that they are doing to earn the money those are also not uh, very ethical so in in if that kind of a uh, situation is there it is very easy for the employees to assume that okay they don't deserve the money that they are making and it is okay to take money from them and same way so even the rationalization can be controlled by having an ethics training and uh, setting a right tone at the top but uh, as i said these are all in the mind 
once there is an opportunity uh, in the form of weak internal control systems in the form of weak detection systems uh, one one would uh, it is very easy for them to have the uh, motivation it is very for easy for them to come come up with some or the other form of rationalization to commit the fraud so uh, again i have rarely seen an organization that has and i'm talking about very very big organizations uh, doing turnover of more than 1000 crores i have rarely seen an organization having a proper whistleblower hotline system a method to communicate any kind of fraud a right uh, you know procedure how how is it supposed to be communicated how is it uh, supposed to how will the response happen uh, very, very, very few organizations have a chief control officer who would overlook all these processes. So that is the reason why there are so many employees who would like to, uh, you know, actually complain, but they do not have the right system. And everybody, everybody is concerned about the anonymity. Everybody is concerned about the protection. If, and some of them are also concerned about the reward which they could get by uh, communicating a suspected fraud so there there is i feel uh, there is a very big gap in this and because of that the organizations are losing a lot of money because uh, even with the cfp uh, research it tells us that organizations are uh, uh, getting the fraud uh, tip no, no, 40, 42 percent of almost 50 percent of the frauds are get come to the notice uh, because of the tip which is given by the whistleblower. So uh, in this case, in our case, it was not there was no whistleblower. There was no whistleblower system in place. There could have been a whistleblower, but there was no whistleblower in system in place. So there was uh, one of the vendors who had been asking for. A reconciliation statement from the uh, sir. Are we short of time? Uh, is, I think sir, you're mute. Sir, you're mute, sir. Yeah, I I thought uh, we'll not miss uh, one or two questions. Also, that's the reason I've just uh, sir. I'll just I'll just finish in five minutes. Sure, yeah, please. Right, right, sir, right. So uh, that was the so in the in our case there was the a vendor who had asked for the reconciliation statement uh, which was required for the annual audit process for that reason and they were they were not giving the reconciliation statement because it was completely manipulated the cash uh, uh, the cash which they had taken now they were they were supposed they were yet to uh, manipulate their accounts which they were going to submit to the management so they had submitted the wrong accounts uh, every month uh, and now they were finalizing the annual accounts and before and the vendor was also finalizing the annual accounts. and in that uh, scenario there was a lot of uh, manipulation was yet to be done and so that's why they were not giving the statement to the vendor because if he finalizes his account according to this statement then uh, there, there could be a problem over here so that that is how then he uh, when he did not receive the statement for long then he complained to the top management uh, that you know your company is not giving me my statement and that is how uh, the process starts so if there would have been a whistleblower mechanism the, probably this could have been detected long back with by some employee who would have complained but because there was no such mechanism uh, it, it 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 went on very late so again uh, after that the next stage comes out to be investigation uh, which is uh, as we know it is uh, uh, the just few points one one should always engage the qualified experts many organizations have observed that they just try to deal with the problem on their own with the internal team which are who are not qualified who are not uh, specialized and they end up with nothing uh, in my book also uh, i have uh, the, there is this whole uh, chapter on mistakes to avoid uh, in an investigation and it really touches upon the point that one has to uh, hire the right professionals do the processes in the right way most or many organizations don't even go for the investigation because they are concerned about the reputation which is again a very big uh, the, the reason why most of the frauds go undetected 
unreported uh, for forever. So it's very important for organizations to do the investigation, conclude the investigation, and do do it through the right uh, process. Uh, in the investigation, we need to manage the evidence. All those things we need to look. Okay, the final slide, the investigation would or would not end into litigation. Litigation, but whenever we are doing an investigation, we have to assume that it will end up in litigation. Uh, that is the way we have to collect evidence. That is the way we have to proceed with every single step, assuming that there could be litigation. Evidence, 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 evidence is the core. Evidence is the one that speaks. No matter whatever is the truth, in my experience, it is what the evidence tells you that is the truth that is going to be acceptable in a court of law that is what stands so it is it is always the evidence and any investigator any person has to understand evidence and so the even the fraudsters even they understand what evidence is if, if they are that smart and they understand what it is very difficult to actually uh, get anything out of that investigation because they would be manipulating the evidence and uh, that could end the case so i think this is all Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bharat, thank you very much. Uh, it was indeed a great session. Uh, of course, uh, considering the time frame, but I believe uh, what required is in kind of these short sessions is a brainstorming where people pick up those uh, key points and probably you know, uh, do a research on them. So right. this is just a token of appreciation from our chapter, which we'll be uh, posting to your uh, uh, address. And, right. uh, liberty of requesting you to have more sessions for us down the lane maybe yeah, certainly. Uh, we, we have more interactive sessions with more specifics and like the way you explain the case study is good i just now ordered the book and tell you. that it is not available in only in one store in one book ensure that it is available as i am talking to you right, and sir. we'll interact certainly right, thank sir. you Bharat. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bharat. Uh, we'll be uh, uh, tracking more and more uh, through various sessions from you. We'll be you know, very happy to learn from you. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. I'll, I'll love to. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.